Well, you guys, welcome back to the channel. Another Bird of Prey falconry episode, and I'm in here with my little friend here, Pedro the 10 year old burrowing owl. Have a look at him. Anyway, it's not all about him, it's all about really some mistakes, simple mistakes that I've made, or friends, or family, or other people I know firsthand have made. Um, I'm not going to name them because it's mistakes that lots of you and possibly myself have made and some mistakes that I've made personally as well. Um, it's not a slight to anyone if you've done these mistakes. I hope you'll understand the explanation of how they happened and probably nod your head and think, yeah, I've been there. So mistakes, uh, we all make mistakes. It doesn't matter what you do human nature is you can't avoid mistakes you can only mitigate them and try and reduce them down to as almost zero level if you make mistakes when you're riding fast motorbikes um, you're going to have a near miss or an accident that could kill you it could injure you and it could certainly cost you a lot of money repairing your bike if you make a mistake at work you're probably going to get a rollicking off your boss and so on but if you make a mistake with animal keeping often it costs that animal health or injury. And that's very, very different indeed. So some of these mistakes was, was spurned on really by something I did recently, just a stupid error. Um, most of these mistakes are born really often from the first one we're going to discuss. That one often leads to many other mistakes being made. Um, yeah, number one, being overburdened. Shut up. Being overburdened. Getting yourself too many birds. Too many birds means you don't have time for the birds <coughs> individually. And it really means you make mistakes along the way with other things, trying to spread your time out. God, they're noisy things, birds. So people often get their first falconry bird and they love it. And they learn a real steep learning curve where they learn things really, really fast. And they feel like they've achieved and they're falconers. And they think, oh, do you know what? I really like this bird. I'm going to keep my, let's say, Harris Hawk. There you go, your classic first bird, really. I'll keep my house up, but I want something else. My friends fly a goshawk, and that's fast. I'm going to get one of them, and then I'm going to get something else. And before they know it, they've got a falcon to fly in the summer, and so on and so forth. A famous saying, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. One well-trained bird is worth so much more than many birds that are poorly trained, sit in trees, don't chase stuff, not biddable, half-trained birds. Most people certainly those that have to work for a living, one hunting bird, one falconry bird, is more than they can take, or at least as much as they can take. At the end of the day, if you've got two hunting birds and you split your hunting time up between them, you're going to have a far better one hunting bird, giving it fair slips and the quarry fair law to escape, finding superb flights and, and the spectacle of the chase, than I'll stand on a wall and let my goshawk fly 20 metres, catch a rabbit and then fly another one. One bird, for most of us, is always going to be better than trying to juggle two. If, though, you want to fly two birds, the alternative can be fly your hunting bird through the six months of the cold and fly a lure falcon. Somewhere you can just walk into a set field to have permission and fly a falcon to a lure that's not for hunting. We discussed lana falcons in the last video. Give you a year-long interest and, and working with birds of prey and two very different ways of doing it so you learn and learn and learn some more keeps it exciting and thrilling that's doable because technically you're looking after two birds but you're only flying and working with one bird at a time don't get overburdened you just end up in a situation where birds aren't housed properly they're not trained properly they're not cared for properly that's probably one of the biggest mistakes people make in falconry they get overburdened and it leads to other mistakes. Now on the on the note of more birds and <laughs> owls, this is a really, really common one. I've got my falconry bird, I love my falconry. Um, I want something for the family to enjoy more, maybe for my kids. Birds are a bit big, the hawk's a bit big, a bit dangerous. I'll get my kids a pet owl. Something for the family to enjoy more, maybe for my kids. Birds are a bit big, the hawk's a bit big, a bit dangerous. I'll get my kids a pet owl. That That is really, really quite a common thing to do. And again, it gives you a different side of birds of prey, a completely different kind of bird to work with. But I can tell you now, for most falconers already flying birds of prey diurnally, falcons or hawks or eagles, I can tell you now, these things become rapidly boring. 
rapidly boring. When you and your family are rearing your little tiny owl, or your big owl, talking about you, you're rearing them up from little tiny owlets, hand feeding them, all the family can partake. It's a cute member of the family. Even a big owl, that only lasts about 15 weeks. And then you've got yourself an owl. An owl that if you work with it and use your full career knowledge and train it, you're probably gonna get it flying backwards and forwards reliably. That's like walking your brilliant working dog to the end of your street and back every day. It becomes uninteresting, it comes, becomes boring, and the cute thing just becomes a noisy, smelly, time-consuming thing that your kids are now bored of when you don't really want to put time into every day. And as soon as you stop working with that owl for a few days, it starts to go wild in its head. And it becomes a bird that then lives in an aviary in your garden. You can't keep your owl tethered. Don't keep owls tethered. Tethered at a show is fine. They're designed to do nothing in the day, but owls don't understand tethering by night. They can't see close up. They fiddle with their kit. They just don't know what's going on. If you can't house an owl, don't get an owl at all for sure. But it just becomes relegated to an aviary or to a shed in a garden. A big owl lives for over 60 years. A classic mistake is getting an owl for the family. A pet owl, yeah, and a pet is the right word. People get them as pets. Don't get an owl because you love your falconry. Stick to your falconry birds. The owl will get boring. It lives a long time. What are you going to do with it? Due diligence, care, keeping your eye on your animals and your livestock, housing them correctly. This is all things that go terribly wrong. And that goes back to often being overburdened, not having enough time for your life, your work and your animals because now you spread your time that you have got too thinly over your animals. Perching again, perching. Birds get entangled on block perches it can happen. I use the most safe tethering systems, or I did really when my birds were tethered and I had a whole team tethered apart from my owls. A, a, great, a great system of inline swivels, extenders, braided kit, high ring perches, high block perches. But no perch system is perfect and birds can get tangled on their perches. And if you haven't got your eye on the ball, that briefly tangled bird can turn into a bird tangled all day and dying from being tangled up. Again, you've got to keep your eye on your stuff. Um, it might not be the perch or the systems design that's wrong. It's probably just you just don't have the time and you've just not paid due diligence and quite enough attention and you've not been able to keep an eye on that animal when it is tethered. So again, lack of time, overburden is a big mistake you can easily fall into. Now, even when it comes to more traditional bow perches, there's something to be really aware of, um, something you can kind of get away with, other things that you really need to change. And one thing to be aware of, have a look at this one here. This one here is very much your typical bought manufactured design of bow perch. And it's actually the commonest sort of shape now, um, ease of manufacture, but it's not really the, the typical design of bow perch that bow perches were designed to look like. But we'll come to that in a second. Something I see quite a lot of, this bar here should be on the ground because if it isn't, the ring, as it passes over the perch, is off the ground here. So when the bird baits, automatically you've got something else encouraging the leash to go up through the train feathers of your bird and damage that tail. This should actually be in need of a foot. Hold on. This is how it should be. Flat with the ground. So the ring here is flat on the ground. If you are going to use your feet to push those perch spikes into heavy ground or hard ground, don't be unsympathetic to mechanical things. Put your feet here and here. Drive the spikes in, not here, where it's just gonna bend your perch. And another thing about these bow perches, of course, is this design. So this design actually, to a degree, goes against the whole point of a bow perch. So the point of a bow perch is your bird baits off, it's low to the ground, it doesn't damage itself, it lands on the grass, and the way the ring moves over the perch that leash doesn't keep going through those train feathers and damaging that tail. But this design, this D-shaped, high, short D-shaped design here, 
actually encourages the ring very often to snag here. And the bird baits forward here or backwards over here. That leash is now right up in the air, really damaging that tail. And with these molded rubbers, the ring actually has a really good habit of snagging on the edge of the molding. You can whip some insulation tape around here and take away, taper that down more so the ring doesn't snag and does pass easily. But this design will never be perfect because it's not the right design of bow perch. Have a look at this really old one. I've had to dig it out. Uh, most of my birds are free lofted now and on, on high rotating ring perches instead of bow perches. But have a look at this design. A much lower, shallower design. This is not a D shape. It's a bow perch, isn't it? It's a shape that you'd expect a bow, a bow and arrow to be. A long, shallow bow. The ring passes easier across this bow. It doesn't get stuck on a real high point here. It automatically slips off one side or the other, even if the bird baits forward or backwards. Nice, smooth leather topping. Flows easily, but the leather, yeah, it's not as good now as a more rougher surface, the molded rubber or AstroTurf. But don't use AstroTurf on your bow perch. It snags the ring terribly. So this is actually the traditional shape of a bow and how they're intended to be. People do make them, do your homework and try and get yourself that shaped bow perch before buying the more standardized D-shaped ones. If a bow perch is what you're gonna use. Friend of mine using a, a freestanding bow perch. Yeah, they're dangerous. Freestanding bow perches. Portable bow perches, indoor bow perches, the ones with like the ski for feet instead of the spikes into the ground. Potentially terrible bits of kit. They're designed to be portable, um, to come into your house. Really, they're designed to be something you put your bird on when you're there, when you're there, or very least when the bird's asleep in the dark. Those perches have an inbuilt danger zone, and that is the end of those ski feet, because the length of them to make those perches practical isn't long enough to stop the leash getting either caught around the end of them as the bird baits forward. It can get the leash literally around the front end of that ski. Worse still, the leash can be pulled underneath that ski, the end of that 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 platform perch, that ski type, um, yeah, foot of the perch. They are lethal. I have seen so many birds tangled up on portable bow perches where they've been left unattended. They really are a bad idea. Don't use them for anything than they're other than they're designed for. Being portable and when you're kind of around most of the time. Um, a friend of mine lost an incredibly, incredibly rare bird of prey. A bird of prey that in Britain, there's probably, there is less than one of bred every year. Incredibly rare bird, and it died tangled up around that kind of perch. So those systems there, yeah, avoid freestanding bow perches. Other than for that, maybe you want to put the bird on a perch indoors for some reason. Indoor manning when you're there, they are definitely a mistake in the making for sure. People are gonna be upset with this. Um, not really the, the bow perch makers because they make other kinds of perches instead. But be sure, use a freestanding bow perch. Yeah, if you're there. I've seen so many, so many tangles and it's all from the same reason. The leash snagging under that foot of that ski platform kind of feet on them. My recent mistake, born completely out of rushing around, too much to do. Now I'm lucky we've got incredibly good staff and volunteers here at the Falconry Centre. Um, my job really has become really just maintenance and repairs. I fly the least birds now than I've ever done, um, certainly for the last sort of 15 years. <sighs> I fly some at the weekends, mostly those that are flying every day here that are adaptable enough to work for me even though I don't work with them on a trusting basis daily like the staff do. Uh, I've just become, yeah, jack of all trades, looking after buildings, structure, office work, and so on and so forth. Recently, as I did mention in the last video, I made a massive error. So I know my, my telemetry kit that I use, and I've used for, yeah, for years and years, 173. 173, I use a Marshall receiver, and I use Marshall 
transmitters to go with that radio telemetry. We needed a new transmitter. We've usually got half a dozen on the go, different ones. So you might need a micro tail mount. You might need to have micro leg mounts. We might have scouts, leg and tail mount, RT pluses, range master, different things that I've acquired from my, when I was flying birds off site all the time. And I'd have the birds all ready to go with their different frequencies on, but they're all on 173. Not checking, literally not checking, not paying attention, rushing around. I asked Jackie, uh, to order a new micro transmitter from Marshall. And she said, oh, it says here, what frequency? I was doing something else, drinking a cup of tea or something. And she was on there and she said, what frequency? And I said, 173. She said, oh, does it matter what, what 173, what? We've got a choice. I said, it doesn't matter as long as it's on 173. I hadn't paid attention. And do you know what? I didn't even notice until then, even though I've got all these transmitters. Our Marshall transmitter uh, right, receiver is set to 173. Point two, something, 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 and uh, something, something, some, something is interchangeable. We can dial that in. No, I ordered 173.0, something, something, something. The 173.0 isn't changeable. The 173.2 isn't changeable. I ordered a transmitter on a frequency that close up, I could hear it clicking. Turned it on, click, 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 off we go, fly the bird. But of course, I couldn't tune that transmitter in properly, so any distance, it was invisible. It didn't count, it wasn't there. Lo and behold, about the second bird, we popped it on, uh, leg mounted a Lana Falcon that hadn't got a tail mount yet, and off she flew. Thankfully, Emily, one of our great staff here, used common sense and field craft and tracked her down and got her back, no problem. But I could have potentially lost a Lana Falcon that was gifted to me, we don't have many secondhand birds, but mortified if it was someone else's bird that you're caring for, and a brand new, 250 quid or whatever transmitter so pay attention not paying attention to detail is a huge mistake in the world of fulkery a huge mistake that leads to so many other mistakes if you can't put things in the right place put things back where they came from have a place for every bit of your kit have a bit of ocd about you be methodical get in routines measure weigh, take notes write down attention to detail is so important in the world of fulkery really is if you're a muddlesome a muddlesome fluffy scruffy untidy person at worst you'll always be losing kit at best something stupid will happen i nearly fell fate about what my bird did now on the back of that is not understanding how to use your kit the biggest one being and the most important one is not understanding how to use telemetry i've made a video about that on a previous channel I'll try and update that on this channel, but the amount of people that responded to that old video, huh, it's not rocket science. No, it's not. So really there's no excuse not to learn how to use your telemetry. If you buy it brand new, it comes with instructions. Read the freaking instructions. Don't be a man. Have all your screws left over at the end because you didn't know what you were doing. Read the instructions. If you don't, you will think that radio telemetry is used by turning around 360 until you get a loud beep and following in that direction. That's the real basics, and just doing that will lose you birds, because there's way more to telemetry than that. Simple things that will help you get a bird back, rather than have you walking away in the exact opposite direction, amongst others. Learn to use your kit properly, and not doing so is a massive mistake that you will only understand when you can't find your bird. What's the point of having a grand's worth of kit if you don't know how to use it? It's stupid. Don't be like that. Find out the basics. I'll get a video up in the next few weeks because new birds are coming soon. New people are using new telemetry. I think it's time I've got some of these tips and things in, but that's another biggie. Don't cock up by not understanding how to use your equipment, whether it's a swivel, leashes, perches, or telemetry. Finally, I think for this set, Understand weight management. Understand weight management, because there's so much more to that, just like telemetry. I'll try and get another video out on that again on this channel. But understanding weight management, it is so much more than writing down the bird's weight until it responds how you want it, because that's not the bird's forever weight. Weight management is about fluidity, feeling the bird's body condition, assessing it's mentally and how it's behaving, and understanding that the weight of your birds can be an incredibly fluid thing, certainly over its first season. 
understand weight management, don't make the mistake of having your bird screwed down on a tight weight that it needed to be on for one day in its early training and turns out that it doesn't need to be at that weight anymore at all and it should be flying much heavier and stronger than it is. Don't fall into that trap, but that's for another video. But do your best, find out and understand weight management of your... So really just a short, short video about some of the mistakes I've made personally, some mistakes my close friends have made personally and the wider world of falconry. Uh, it's an endless thing. I've got so many more mistakes I can share with you. Uh, I wrote two articles on it recently in the World of Falconry magazine. Um, I'll pull from that. I might even make those articles into comedic comedic videos for you, a bit light-hearted. Some of the absolute cock-ups I've made in falconry, but some of those are really key, guys. And if you're getting into birds of prey or you're new to birds of prey, especially, for goodness sakes, learn from my mistakes and all the other people's mistakes. The difference is I'll tend to tell you what I've done. Other people often won't. Learn from other people's mistakes where you can and listen to their advice. Advice is often from people that have made the mistakes they can see you're going to make. Don't be like a, a never-ending teenager, not listening to their parents who are telling their kids all the things not to do because they know what they're going to do wrong because the parents did it themselves. That's the world of family life. It never ends for generations. But as falconers, for goodness sakes, if people give you advice, kind of think it's probably because they know the mistake you're going to make. That's why they're giving you the advice. It might be against what you want to do, but they're giving you advice because it's what you should do. Tune in, subscribe, bell notification. See you in the next one.